Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Bill Zahner. I think you all know me, so I'm speaking mostly for the online audience. Uh, that we are delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Lena Vessel from the University of Paderborn in Paderborn, Germany. Um, and Dr. Vessel uh, does research on uh, undergraduate mathematics education and connecting undergraduate mathematics to the uh, mathematics that teachers need. Um, and specifically, we'll be talking today about uh, abstract algebra and school algebra and connections there too. Uh, we actually connected uh, around, Elena and I connected over uh, a common interest in language and mathematics as well. Um, and so we were part of the same, same topic study group at ICMI in 2016 in Hamburg, Germany, uh, where we met. And then Dr. Vessel was so kind as to host me for a colloquium this past summer in Paderborn. Um, so returning the favor. One other fun fact is that Lena is a expert rock climber, I believe. <laughs> uh, has picked that up, that skill, working with Gabriela Hernandez here at, uh, in San Diego, um, and is... Uh, an outdoor enthusiast, to say the least. Yes. So we are excited to learn. So I'll hand it off. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thanks everybody for being here. I actually don't know who's out there online. <laughs> that will be exciting after the talk if I see your questions or if I see your um, online faces. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Some people already know me because I've been here a couple of times already. <laughs> um, and yes, it's a pleasure to talk about my design research in the context of pre-service teacher education. It's kind of a smaller research fields of mine. So I know that there are people out here who've been doing it for years <laughs> and for like in many varieties and many strands. And so I'm basically working on a very small part just to put the pressure a bit <laughs> low and not like, <laughs> pressuring myself um there's something in the chat i don't know if that's oh, relevant yeah. for me ah, okay okay yeah and so for today um i i don't have a i don't i didn't put an agenda in the talk but i rather prefer to give you some questions which i will work upon through the talk so um questions like what should pre-service actually pre-service teachers actually um learn in university mathematics classes is one of the things I want to talk about. Then the second one would be the question of the learning processes, because in Germany we have a huge focus on products, like what prospective teachers write down in their um, bridging gaps task, but not so much on the processes. And um, of course, why and for whom this topic is relevant should also be discussed. Is it possible you could stand oh, yeah. the other people? Yeah, sure. <laughs> which 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 side is better for you? That part? Computer, that part? Yes. Yeah. What about where is the where is the um oh, yeah. is there anything? That happens to you all the time. I only have one outlet over here. Oh, no. uh -oh. I'm sorry. I, 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 oh, no worries. It's gonna be helpful. I'm messing it up. No worries. Or you know, I can do. I can switch this whole table over, and then that way. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. There we go. Clever. There we go. I don't want to be the director for some reason. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a kind of an, a slope. <laughs> ah. Think yeah. I fixed it. No. Okay. How does that look like? Is that better? Yeah, yes. Thank you. And um, for getting into the topic, I just um, brought some information with me about myself, like some personal information. Um, what Bill um, probably also um, remember, but not everybody remembers, is that I did my PhD in Dortmund. So when I was here in 2018, um, I just moved from Dortmund to the University of um, Freiburg, which is um, in the south. So these are like the three places um, I've been working at and on, in, and I'm working in Paderborn right now. And uh, just a fun fact, I think we missed that one. I don't know why, yes. <laughs> the fun fact is that I actually still live in Dortmund, but work in Paderborn. And this is like a 70 miles distance. And I just looked up 
like what's comparable to <laughs> if I commute to work from San Diego for 70 miles. So this is about the range uh, that Dortmund and Paderborn are distance from each other. So that gives you an idea how small Germany actually is. If you look at the map of whole Germany, um, this is kind of small compared to, to this country. So this is my Western home. <laughs> and it's quite different from, from the rest of Germany, especially the South, if you're familiar with the South. Yes, and um, that was the personal part. The general background um, is, of course, the post-COVID situation. We just had a, a larger testing going on, and that was really, uh, yeah, not surprisingly bad that we had um, huge decreases in math proficiency across all levels. Um, so all levels have like this decline in proficiency in on that standardized test. And this is especially, um, or the decrease is particularly huge for children from non-academic backgrounds, which is also not surprising. And I bet it's like the case probably all over the world and probably similar here. At the same time, we have um, these modeling data for um, teacher shortages, which come up. So that's why we have a huge funding going on in Germany right now on teacher education and on like talking about teacher education because of this expected shortage, especially in math and sciences. And um, we already see a huge dropout of um, prospective students in teacher education programs in mathematics. So we have the highest dropout rates in mathematics. There are not as high dropout rates in other subjects, like mathematics is especially huge for um, especially prospective high school teachers. They drop out at huge um, rates, which is also um, a reason why we are working in this field. Um, to show you what teacher education actually looks like in Germany, it's like um, uh, some random um, person who wants to become a teacher in Germany. It's like, yes, I've always been interested in math. Let's become a math teacher. What options do I have? So if I want to become a teacher in Germany, I could decide whether I want to go into primary, lower secondary or upper secondary high school level or into the vocational field. So right at the beginning of my studies, aged 18, 17, 19, um, I sign up for mathematics and I can choose between the different levels of future teaching. <clears throat> um, for my talk, I'll concentrate on the future high school teachers because the future high school teachers have a specific curriculum of more advanced mathematics compared to, for example, the primary and middle school teachers. And um, that's the group of students I'm responsible for in the mathematics education part back home. So that's my cohort, so to say. So this um, cohort or the student who's deciding for a high school uh, mathematics teaching program uh, would <coughs> ideally <laughs> um, study a bachelor, a master's program, and then will end up in a practical teacher training. So this is what it looks like, um, three years bachelor, two years master's and one and a half year teacher training. And this is um, obligatory as well. Like it gives you the um, second credentials. You have the so-called first credentials after the bachelor master and the second credentials after the practical teacher training. And after all of that, you're qualified for teaching high school um, math. And if you um, sign up, or if you like enroll in that teacher um, program, you of course choose your subject um, like mathematics and a second subject, but then you also study of course, educational sciences and do student um, teaching in already in the bachelor. Um, the math subject um, studying math of course consists of the mathematics classes and the mathematics education classes. In the master's program, this, um, this um, division of the two subjects and educational sciences and student teaching goes on, except that we have a full semester of student teaching in the master's program. So they already um, 
have that teaching experience for six months in the master's program. May, may I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, I sure. Apologize. The folks online are only seeing half of your slide. I'm not sure why. Do you want to try to stop um, there? And then there is actually something you could do, but I was just uh, telling people. You can go to view, which is in the upper right corner of your screen. Mm -hmm. You can choose the standard view rather than having people appear alongside. And then the, that oh, gallery of people alongside will appear, but there is a minimized choice. Mm. I don't know if anybody's seeing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's still it's still cut off. Yeah, yeah, it is still a little bit cut off. I, oh, what if they... I think if you cancel your, your sharing screen and then share again, we might, it might. You know, if we... What if folks were to pin it? In terms of folks. Then if you share again, and what? If the viewer, if all the viewers pin it, or if you <laughs> share it. Oh, okay. Better. Okay, that's better. Mm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, Sorry. it looks fine on that screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it looks the same on, on, the, on the online meeting. Okay. okay. No worries. So now you had time to digest um, what a typical mathematics future high school teacher would study in Germany. Sure. Um, what are typical subject Bs? If they're oh. teachers in mathematics, what's the second subject? Oh, you can basically choose whatever you like. Um, so common used to be mathematics and physics, which is the preferred combination of our mathematics professors. They love students, students with mathematics and physics. They don't really like mathematics and physical education. They always, <laughs> they really like complaining to me about it. Like, Hey, uh, that shouldn't be allowed. And I'm like, okay, why not? I mean, um, <laughs> they want to be a coach. <laughs> um, you have like religious education, um, geography, biology, um, English, German, um, which is not a good combination. So you shouldn't do two main subjects because then you have lots of grading in while, while teaching and lots of responsibilities. So I think physics is still, or like computer sciences yeah. is still a combination which is quite popular, but basically you can, you can mix. Um, which doesn't go for the minor subjects like there are some universities that don't that don't let you enroll in for example religious education and physical education like at some places you have to have a main so-called like one of the field subjects when you say physical education you mean like sports and exercise? yes yes oh, where does statistics fit is it part of subject a or is, would it be an option for subject b um statistics is in is part of mathematics so if i decide to teach mathematics i would have to study statistics but we don't have statistics as a subject like not for future teachers you can study of course statistics but then you become a person working for an insurance or something like that yeah. and of course there are much more subjects if you go into the vocational field then you have um, business administration, engineering, mechanical engineering, computer engineering, all kinds of engineering, social health things like personal, uh, elderly care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives another huge variety of subjects. Yeah, so that's actually, I think, a good thing that the students have like so many opportunities and possibilities um so that's something we we like uh what the students don't really like is um when you ask them for um how they experience their math mathematics studies so the part i just enlightened with the mathematics classes they evaluate these classes very poorly like this student uh, took part in an interview and he says i think sometimes it's a bit difficult detached from everything that has to do with teaching so basically linear algebra and calculus you think to yourself i'll never need that again so that refers to the main huge classes they need to take right at the beginning of their studies they start with linear algebra one two calculus one two later three then some uh, differential um, geometry statistics stochastics 
um, numeric, is it numeric? Numerics. So all that, all that really abstract um, advanced mathematics. And um, this is not a single opinion. So there are um, <laughs> studies like interview studies and also um, survey studies um, for that cohort, cohort of uh, future high school teachers that they really have a problem with seeing the relevance of these classes, which is also why the dropout rates are quite high. And like for the personal um, perspective on that, it was like when I was studying my first semester, I was also like about to drop out and either change to another subject or um, go to like middle school teaching because I also just, I, it just didn't really, I didn't really enjoy that. And I think that's a big thing that people have this issue of, okay, if I don't enjoy it, why should I go through all that pain? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I might as well switch. And this is um, a huge problem we are facing right now. And of course, this is not a surprising problem. We all, or most of all are familiar with uh, Klein's uh, description of the second discontinuity. So. This was already described in the early 1900s. And um, if we read his other um, ideas, like the elementary mathematics from an advanced standpoint, this was maybe, I don't know for sure, because there might be papers in other cultures, but I think this is somehow the first paper on a, did a didactic approach, how to work on this discontinuity, because he made the suggestions how we could um, teach geometry in a more um, teacher profession oriented way. But as you all know, um, things moved slowly. This was 1905 and 1933. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, many things have happened in Europe. We had like major events taking place. And um, I put this ship because <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I put this um, this ship with a reference to the metaphor of uh, Van Merien Boer, who said that instructional design in general, he compares or they compare that um, to an ocean liner, which is huge, slow, ponderous, and requires large amounts of energy and a great deal of time to move it, even one degree off its current path. So I think this is very true for German. I don't know if I can speak for other cultures, but in Germany, our math classes are still very traditional, very just the same as in the 1980s, like the, the people I talked to in my, like my parents' generation, for example. And um, um, the second thing that, especially if I'm in Burr is, um, known for is like his um, cognitive uh, learning theoretical arguments for the second discontinuity and like why we should like put more effort in in changing instructional designs and making the the connections more explicit i don't go into detail here but if you're interested in that approach that's definitely a, a, a worthwhile read i could share with you if you want to go into detail here um I steer my ship into the direction of like professional teachers um, and mathematical knowledge for teaching, um, which doesn't really explain why it took so long, but we saw that this they sped up. I see it like that in the early 2000s and with 2008 and ball and bars and these the developments, the speed is um, accelerating. I think lots of, um, lots of, um, ideas have been written down and people came up with many ideas in this field um, in a very short amount of time compared to the hundred years that mm -hmm. that not that were basically not that much happened but <laughs> in the last 20 years um, we sped up in this field and we have various frameworks that frameworks which describe the domains of teacher knowledge so um Deborah balls ball I um, no, egg. I don't know if you call it. Yes, yeah, so we call it egg. <laughs> and I is German for egg. So if I say ball, I, it's like just a false friend because I think of the egg as I and you think of my I. But yes, you're familiar with that. So um, 
while this like gives us the differentiation of the different facets, we also see approaches that um, and models which focus on the development um, of these proficiency and prof professional competencies of the student. So if we go back to our prospective teacher student, um, we had, do have work um, that researches um, the development of professional teacher knowledge. So this is why I, this is the part where I want to focus on because we, of course, do instructional design and design research. So we um, looked more precisely in the work um, by Nick Wasserman um, on how to develop mathematical knowledge for teaching. And for doing that, we also draw to or draw on his work on the differentiation of local and non-local knowledge and non-local knowledge for teaching. So in his um, framework, we have the more local mathematics, which is very close to the mathematics you're teaching. So temporarily and content wise, this is the local neighborhood, for example, if you teach um, equations in year seven, this could be something from the local mathematics and compared to that or contrasted to that, we have the non-local mathematics which is further away from our um, local teaching content. In his framework, um, we see, or we, um, he, they, um, see and look at these relations between uh, local and non-local mathematics and come up with the notion of non-local mathematics for teaching. So you see that this has a very uh, functional perspective um, and they describe it as follows, that um, they are helping pre-service and in-service teachers see the connections to the local content they will teach, especially in ways that fundamentally alter their understanding of that local content, and then provide, providing explicit ways that such knowledge might influence their actions as a teacher could could help foster the development of non-local mathematical knowledge for teaching. I highlighted somehow the train of thought here because it's a very dense, <laughs> a very dense um, uh, description of why they argue for um, this idea and this notion of non-local non-local mathematical knowledge for teaching right away with the effects they um, see if we teach non-local mathematic, non mathematical knowledge for teaching. Gives me a hard time for my <laughs> uh, non-native tongue, <laughs> um, the concept of non-local mathematical knowledge for teaching. Um, because um, of course you see here, they also focus on the connections and they give us a language for talking about connections. So that's basically what helped us a lot to talk to other people and talk about the the mathematics we actually refer like are we talking about something local or non-local because in our designs we also make connections not only between school and um, university mathematics but also like in the spiral curriculum between for example year five year seven year nine mathematics which is also an important line of connection that we can grasp with this idea of we talk about the local teaching content and the ideas which are non-locally above that local teaching content. Um, and again, a second argument why um, we use Nick's framework is because they think about how we can develop this mathematical knowledge for teaching. So while there are many people who look at how can we test PCK, CK, um, which uh, differences are they, how do they uh, interrelate and influence each other, this is not so much uh, what I need back home. I'm rather interested in, yeah, what can we do with our students to um, actually work on the non-local mathematics for teaching? So um, we adapted his framework um, and his framework or their framework. I probably should give credits to the research group and not only to him. Um, so <laughs> they... Um, have the um, motivation to consider the relations between the secondary mathematics, the teaching of secondary mathematics and advanced mathematics and suggest um, to start with um, uh, 
um, some pedagogic situation in this um, phase of building up. They call it building up from teaching practice. So we start in that um, facet of teaching secondary mathematics. And then in a second phase of learning, we deal with the advanced mathematics. And then we step down um, back to the teaching practice. So that's the um, suggested sequence of how you can design, um, know how you can structure a teaching design. So when we do in design research, think of what is it actually what we want to teach and how do we want to teach it? The how question can be answered by structuring it according to that sequencing principle starting from um, teaching practice, doing a relearning or learning, and then go back to the um, teaching practice. And when we look at the situation in the teaching practice, um, they also give us advice for these um, situations. So there are criteria. Um, they suggest that these pedagogical situations um, motivate the study of advanced mathematics, um, that they make the students see the relevance of the content and that they provide an application for how the advanced mathematics might inform my teaching so that you can also see the relevance for my um, actual teaching in the future. And this again, I think it's kind of totally reasonable, but like reflecting about it, like searching for um, situations that actually um, um, gain something, um, how you react to a student if you have the advanced mathematical knowledge, I think helps um, to find the learning goals and to to set the to set the the context. Like what I what are we exactly choosing from our algebra curriculum um, for our future teachers? A second um, or further criteria um, they suggest is um, that the pedagogical situations are authentic. So they should be true to situations that arise in teaching and that they actually um, ask our prospective teachers to engage in high leverage practice. So that's another thing they, um, they suggest in total if you, um, Oh, that's Siri again. Sorry. <laughs> mm, so if you no, it's still there. Sorry. So why are they doing it, or what's the intended learning um, effects um, in this? notion of designing um, teaching like that. Um, the claim is that it reshapes students' mathematical knowledge. And I will go into detail on that. Like, what does it mean to reshape the knowledge? And that it has an influence on the prospective teachers' future teaching in classroom, um, which is methodologically very different to, um, to study. Like, the investigation of that is super hard. And there are like two or three studies from that research group where they have a certain job task they look at in the future teaching and they relate that to the actual course they have taught before. So that's a worthwhile read if you're interested in this uh, influence on future teaching practice. Um, the first intended effect of the notion of reshaping is something that we concentrate on um, before we go into teaching practice like future teaching practice, because we don't have um, this long-term capacity of going into the students' classrooms, but we rather start with the, with the notion of reshaping. And reshaping in this framework means um, that there is a change in one's cognitive system that accompanies a transformation of existing understandings together with the construction of new knowledge. So um, the idea or the the hoped for effect is that some kind of reshaping in the mathematical um, knowledge would take place. And um, to further unfold this notion of reshaping, um, Lee suggested the framework of deepening, extending, um, unifying and strengthening, which is why we 
call it, or I, I don't know if he calls it Edo's framework as well. This is like, we talk about it as the Edo's framework to shorten, to shorten that model. <laughs> um, so that we know, okay, when we speak of Edo's, we mean the facets of reshaping, which can be deepening, extending, unifying and strengthening. Um, I put the example with the neutral element. So um, this is something that you might want to understand as a concept, but of, but of course, um, there are subconcepts you need to understand. And if you unify those under the concept of the neutral element, you're in this facet of unifying. If you only have like some subconcepts develop and you extend then, of course, there's the, the idea of extending. And then the facet of strengthening is more looking um, to the to the relations between the different subconcepts. So far, um, um, I haven't figured out. I would recall like extending, unifying, and strengthening that they all um, lead to kind of deepening. So still, I, I still have not figured out how you can deepen something without the other three facets. This is something we are still working out and we are still understanding. So far, we decided to look into the facet of unifying because algebra has this many um, options for unifying processes. So um, structuring the learning content of algebra, we were like, yes, unifying seems to be a good way to look at the learning processes. So unifying um, defined by Lee again is uh, that a learner can unify the existing understanding and un understandings under an overarching mathematical object or concept by increasing the extent to which seemingly unrelated mathematical concepts become more coherent. Um, and um, what Lee is doing is that he adapts um, developmental stages of connections to this facet of unifying. So he speaks of um, the interest stage when we have only this isolated focus on some components of a concept um, if we already have discovered some common properties um, and see these relationships and talk about them, we are on the interest stage. And if we reflect the coordination and the relationship as a whole, we are on the trans, trans stage. And this is something that nicely can nicely be adapted to um, speak and to unfold this process of unify. So you can make up um, stages where the students are in this process of unifying. Again, um, just one example for um, the neutral element here. Um, if you look, if you look at the typical content in our um, abstract algebra class, this is probably in the first uh, maybe two or three weeks. So this is not really, this is really just the beginning. Um, but we already see. Um, a whole lot of potential um, activities where processes of reshaping could take place. And this is only highlighting the process of unifying again. So if we think about the connections, uh, the, the yellow connections, this is something uh, where we just highlighted potential moments of unifying processes. And this is, um, basically everything we deal with in our teaching learning arrangements. So, so far we didn't really get any further than staying um, in this part. And oh no, we, we also work on inverse functions, but you will see that in, in a second when I show you the design of the teaching units. Hey, yeah. Are you using um, scheme in the sense of Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. There's a lot of there's a lot of words in this um, in this <laughs> map that I didn't explain. Um, we like not we. Yeah, we especially the PhD student who's working in that. She's doing the structuring the learning content and like has a big learning landscape and wrote down all the all the schemes that need to be developed. Um, for each like box in there so you can go into much more detail here if you look at the if you look at the mathematical content 
So this brings me to selected research questions. So really just, just um, a first glimpse um, of what we are doing. So we look at the design um, of teaching learning arrangements and how they can be designed for developing non-local knowledge for teaching. And we operationalize that with the reshaping framework. So right now we are looking on teaching designs for unifying local and non-local mathematics. Um, and on the, on the learning processes side, we have um, the question of how the learning processes can be identified along the intended learning pathways and how can we describe them, which concepts and misconceptions can we see and which unifying processes can we see. So this is typically design research. We have like questions which focus on the design and questions which focus on the research, on the learning processes. You see that in our typical um, design research model, um, where we also have this idea of a design process with design results, the research process with research results. And we are actually right now in the third cycle. Um, so we did a lot of work on specifying and structuring learning goals and contents. We had a design and tried it out two times already. We started a third cycle in December, so next week, um, conducting the next um, round of um, design experiments. Um, we already developed local theories, but of course we adapt them and um, still need to do a lot of analyzing the transcripts we are getting. Um, on the result level, um, I will show you a short insight into our adaptation of the design principles, like what does that look like? And I will just very quickly look into the learning processes. And I still see that I have to hurry up. <laughs> Talked a, a, too much about Paderborn and the distance between <laughs> Paderborn and Dortmund. <laughs> yeah, so um, as I promised, in the abstract, I told you I was going to talk about design principles. So we basically adapted the sequencing principle of um, Wasserman and colleagues, and we weren't quite happy with it on its own. So we needed to um, come up with an additional design principle, and I will talk about both. The first one is the easy one to understand because you are already familiar with the building up, the learning, and the stepping down phase. In our setting, we put relearning here because all of our high school students um, start with linear algebra, so they already learn something about groups. And we worked with our teaching designs with them um, when they were in the beginning of the master's program. So they had they had some of prior knowledge, and we adapted the model and have like a building up, a relearning, and a stepping down phase. The building up phase is. In this, um, in this teaching unit on solving equations, we start with, is that too small? Is a, it's a simple linear equation and it is a, um, a middle school student, Julia, who has solved for x, for x. Um, and this, the prospective students um, are asked to check for correctness and describe, this, describe the steps that you, Julia, carried out in solving that problem. And then we introduce uh, symmetric mappings in the learning phase. So they are already um, asked to collect first ideas of similarities and differences um, to another equation, which is dealing with um, combining symmetric mappings. Did you see what D120 and S1 are? Oh, yeah. Um, that's like the uh, rotation and the, uh, how do you say? Reflection. Uh, yes. Yes, I didn't change everything to your probably standardized American notation. Sorry about that. Um, but you see it here. Like these are the elements of D3. Um, and we have three reflections 
and two rotations. Yes. So this is the advanced mathematical context. Um, we work on um, the symmetric mappings. Um, the students are asked to operate with them in the context of two dimensional shapes. Again, they are checking equations. Um, of course, this is something um, which is which goes to the learning phase because this is something they are not yet familiar with. Um, and they are asked to discuss similarities and differences between Julia's solution and the solution of solving the equation with symmetric mappings, um, which in the end of the learning phase leads to talking about general conditions for solving general equations. Um, in the stepping down phase, we have this, I didn't, I didn't translate that too, but it says um, strategies for solving equations with X. So that's from a typical textbook and the students are asked to react, um, uh, to adapt the wording in this, um, I call it red box. So um, they are asked to evaluate this. Um, what do you think of it? Would you use it in that way or would you change it? Um, this was the teaching learning unit on solving equations. The second one would be on properties of algebraic stru structures, especially associative associativity and commutativity and inverse functions. Um, and in all three um, teaching designs, this is again, just an example on the first teaching design, you just saw the structure and um, we came up with content learning goals and practice-based learning goals. And we like try to actually think about in which phase we work on which learning goal. Yep, and you see that we again use the EDOS framework and also use that for um, the wording in our learning goals. Um, I was just, I'm sorry, I have to run, but I was going to ask, do you use anything that like are counter examples, like stuff that doesn't commute, for example? Yes, that's um, um, part of the second uh, one. When we talk about the properties more into detail, they have to contrast like some that commute and some that don't, and they have to like uh, put them into a Venn diagram and like talk about um which algebraic structures fulfill like are, are do commute and which are don't. And if that if it's true that every um, associate algebraic structure is commute to, to com, commune commutative. commutative as well. <laughs> You're saying everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, something that's we work on in the psychology. Like yes. Oh, so now so much much. <laughs> yes, I told Bill already it's coming up every now and then. I don't know why and I didn't turn it off. Okay, so that was the um, design principle, like the sequencing principle and how we sequence um, our teaching design. Um, this didn't completely make us happy because the sequencing principle only gives you um, a recommendation how to sequence the whole structure, the whole teaching unit, like the structure of the teaching unit, but it didn't help us on the task level. So um, making up the individual task, like compare Nicholas and Julia's um, solutions um, and I don't know, collect similarities and differences, stuff like that. This is something, um, of course, we came up with um, because the sequencing principle doesn't tell you actually what kind of tasks um, you should apply. So um, our second design principle looks like that. This is a bit more theoretical in its, um, and like takes up the um, logical structure of design elements in this if and then structure. So we have the intended effect. Our idea was that we wanted to initiate unifying processes of local and non-local concepts under an overarching mathematical idea. And the question is, okay, how do we get there? Um, we design our teaching designs in that way that our pre-service teachers relate local and non-local representations 
and we have them doing that by contrasting and comparing activities. So we use the contrasting, contrasting and comparing as a design element in our teaching designs. Um, and the argument here would be, um, again, not mathematics specific research, but just general um, learning sciences that contrasting and comparing um, would explicate common characteristic properties. And in our case, that would refer to local and non-local registers and representations. So this is um, why you see um, all the different, maybe it, it reacts to C, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you see all the different kind of um, representations from the non-local and the knowledge, the non-local and the knowledge, non-local and local knowledge um, of teaching. So we kind of used, um, searched for an, a way to connect them. So this is um, the design we came up with. Um, we did the design experiments. And now I would like to quickly show you um, what the learning processes look like. Um, so we did, a content analysis of our database and the database was was the two cycles of design experiments that I just referred to prospective high school teachers. We did some um, coding, um, which I don't I, I, I can't show everything of that, but we coded for the algebraic concepts. Um, I just listed them here so you you can see what's going on in the second and in the third um, teaching design. Um, we coded for the algebraic setting, um, like whether we are in the non-local or local um, sphere. And then we coded in the reshaping um, processes we coded for unifying with the inter, inter and uh, trans stages, um, which is just the fir first thing like, okay, let's start with, the, with um, unifying. Of course, one could also like move on and look at deepening or um, strengthening or extending. And um, you already saw uh, Julia solving equations with fractions. We also had the students um, checking for correctness um, with like um, real numbers instead of fractions. Uh, we changed that, but the data is still from the first cycle when they were working on this. Um, so maybe you read Antje and Maya yourselves for a second. So Antje and Maya basically just do what we, we asked them to do. Uh, they describe the solution process. Um, and we already see um, that they stay in the setting, like they stay in the um, local setting of teaching equations or talking about these equations. And this is basically um, some hints on um, that you, you can leave out the zero, that the zero, um, that we have the, well, they don't talk about inverse elements, but they talk about the concrete numbers here. Um, and then in the second step, we have a, an additional task. I already showed that one to you, where we have um, the, sym the symmetric mapping, the symmetric mappings that are, um, again, um, shown to them and they need to describe and check for correctness too. So in this part, they refer to the last two steps when you can leave out the identity. Um, and when you get something with the identity and you combine something with the identity, you get the something again. So this is um, what they think of the identity and the non-local setting. Again, 
um, while they describe and check for correctness, they stay in this um, setting of the non-local content. Um, but we already see um, that they have like unifying processes going on, but only for the non-local setting. And then in the third, in the third part of the teaching design, um, they are asked to find similarities and differences between Julia's and Nico's solution. And I have you read again on your own. So what we see here is that they identify the zero and the identity as neutral elements in each case for each operation. And that um, they also refer to their connections so that we would put that as one example where we see that they are arguing or are arguing no, that they are referring and making connections on, a, on this um, third trans stage. And this was Antje and Maya. Um, in total, we had five pairs of students in the second cycle. And group two, three, and five, um, like the processes of group two, three, and five looked very similar. Just like you saw, um, they stay and give a description of the solution steps. They do not refer to the local equation when they talk about the non-local. Um, solution process and they unify on trans stage when they are asked to compare and contrast. There's one pair of students, Stefan and um, Emily. Um, they do that a bit differently um, because um, in the part where they are asked to talk about Nicholas um, solution and the equation with the symmetric mapping, mappings, they say, um, Stefan says it doesn't do anything. It is like the last step with the zero. So he already referred to uh, Julia's solution and um, already talking about Julia's equation. Um, Emily said, yes, zero, she can leave, uh, leave it out, right? And Stefan says, zero is zero. And um, mm -hmm. they actually learn about the zero element as another term for the neutral element. So this is again something I think that has a lot to do with wording and like technical terms for how we talk about the neutral element because we use the neutral element, but the identity is like reserved for everything that's geometrical. Um, and another more general term would be the zero, which is, um, although it's usually bound to uh, the arithmetic context, we still have that as another term. And so this is why we already see that very implicitly that Stefan already uh, thinks more general and like makes other connections compared to Antje, Maya and the other groups um, we've seen so far. So um, summarizing that, um, we see gr group four is a different story. So I only talk about like um, two, three, five and one. You saw Antje and Maya, and on the other hand, we have Emily and Stefan, who like deal a bit differently with um, Julia's and Nicholas um, equations. And what we don't know yet is um, why, <laughs> uh, what makes them um, doing this cross references already at that earlier stage, because we so far didn't, and I just quickly go to my last slide and go to that point that we still need to analyze the concept development. Um, like the, the actual concepts we see that the students have developed of um, the group axioms and like the actual mathematical um, analysis. So we didn't do that. We just looked at the unifying concepts and we have a like idea hypothesis that that could explain if we look into the concept development of Stefan and Emily, 
that we might find differences there compared to the other groups that made them uh, drawing other connections compared to like students like Antje and Maya. So this is still going on, what we still need to do. Um, if I summarize, if I summarize um, the design pr principles and the learning processes, um, well, I said that we adapted the sequencing principle and that works quite well, um, but it didn't help us on the micro task level, which is why we introduced the principle of contrasting and comparing relating local and non-local representations. And um, we have first, uh, first empirical data on the learning processes and what they look like when um, we ask the students to contrast and compare. And on the level of the learning processes, we use the EDOS framework and it has proven to be applicable for investigating um, the in initiated learning processes. So this is something we like, okay, this seems to be, um, th this seems to work. Um, and we have like first phenomena, we still wanna investigate further with the EDOS framework and of course the mathematical concept development. And last point, um, we also didn't look at the last phase yet, the stepping down phase. Like what does that actually do <laughs> to the practice-based knowledge? Like how do they actually use the mathematical knowledge, whether it's local or non-local, for um, carrying out some practice-related tasks? So the learning goals that we um, also set up for the practice-based part. Yep, I think that's where we are now. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? I don't know. So one question, I, maybe not, maybe I'm asking a question that you didn't try to answer, but or maybe this is that last part, the stepping down that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if uh, even from informal conversations with your participants, yep. do they appreciate, you started with the example of the discontinuity and the mm -hmm. saying, this doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm wondering if this kind of activity, when you talk to the learners about yep. it, do they appreciate this kind yep. of activity? Do they yep. acknowledge the yep. utility of it? Yep. Yes. Um, we start with a short entrance, like two questions, like how did you um, experience your study so far? Anything particular you want to say about how useful, how you sense, how, what do you think of the mathematics? And then they often say, hmm, I'm not so happy. <laughs> and then um, we say, okay, we want to work on these connections. So today we work on this and that. And then at the um, exit of the interview of the design experiment, it's like a design experiment with a short interview in the beginning and a short interview at the end. So they often say, um, or react very positively. So yeah, this this is like kind of the things that I would like to do more of because um, it's something I can I can see which or how it could probably help me teaching later on. And it finally finally we finally we talk about some algebraic um, more advanced algebraic things that I can see the connection to school mathematics because usually, usually the lectures stay very abstract and they just don't see the connection on their own. And I refer to Van Marian Burr that it's just not surprising that they don't see these connections because we don't help them seeing the connections. Nice talk, I really enjoyed it. I drew attention to the, the design principles. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. One is um, related to pedagogy that you use in your courses. You mentioned that the oh, we use a lot. in the secondary school is still very, very traditional. And what does that look like yeah. in your undergraduate classes? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yes, traditional um, algebra, traditional would be a lecture with a board, chalk, lots of proving, lots of, I don't know. Here's an example, but no, don't look at the example we go on. And yeah. when we work with them, we have like, um, um, we work, more maybe more inquiry oriented because 
We also applied some of the guided reinvention material from the teaching abstract algebra for understanding curriculum. So we have the students actively, okay, check this, make up your ideas, write them down, and then we talk about them. So it's a lot of engaging the students into talking about something. And we um, also have a second design element that I didn't talk about, um, the curriculum spiral. So we, we bring that with us and we bring the excerpts from school textbooks and like, okay, here's the, here's the copies, here's the spiral spiral, um, use that and make a, make a structure, structure them in there. Do you see something or how does that relate to university if we extend the spiral? So there's some principles, pedagogical princi principles that they learn about in the mathematics education class and we use them. Can I kind of follow up with that? So, so if you're if you're creating class environments which are more inquiry oriented, yeah, there's the the potential and opportunities to positively affect students' beliefs about mm -hmm. about the learning process, about teaching process, about their role, others' roles. Um, and so I was wondering if you been gaining some insights on the shifting beliefs around. Uh, what it means to know mathematics, what it means to teach mathematics, yes. to do mathematics. Yes, it's not a focus in this study, um, simply because it's only my PhD student and me, and <laughs> she writes her dissertation about the design principles, and in this short interview part, again, she, she wants to, she thinks about beliefs, and she's, it's always parallel somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it's running there and we have it in mind and it's always somewhere above our heads. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, we need to look at that because there's definitely something happening. Um, but we don't know yet <clears throat> when and how. Or if we need a further funding for that. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> so this was fascinating to me because I teach algebra courses and I'm always, and I also have had children, and so I'm also thinking, always thinking about how does what I teach relate to school math. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember school mathematics that well. Um, and I, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I guess the main one I would think of is, do, do you have a, like a catalog? Here you talk about solving an equation. Yeah. Do you have a catalog of different ideas? It would be interesting to see a catalog of different ideas yeah. that are important in school yeah. mathematics. If I don't have about. it, but there is this book I can show to you in a second, maybe when we fix the technical issues. There is a whole <laughs> compendium uh, edited by uh, Nick Wasserman go, go ahead. <laughs> on algebra connections. I, I, not sure um, and there is one paper when he and um, Suminen, she wrote her PhD dissertation um, about the school connections between algebra, university algebra and school algebra. So what we did is that we um, used that work for specifying our content learning goals. So we were like, okay, algebra is so huge. Um, which topic do we pick for our modules? And we read their papers because they tell you, okay, this, this, and this could be good points where you can start with. Um, so yeah, it comes down to four topics, um, which gave us an idea where to start. And I think that's a good read for everybody who's teaching abstract algebra, just to, okay, I don't I don't have the time to think about all connections. Let's start with the ones they suggest because they already thought about it so deeply. Mm -hmm. That's how we did it. I guess one other thing, um, um, have you ever looked at abstract algebra textbooks in the United States? Because I'm curious no. if you would see a big difference between the ones used in Germany. We actually don't have textbooks in Germany. Every teacher, like every professor, does his own script. So that's why this is a bit messed up, all the research on tertiary education, because it highly varies between professor to professor to professor to professor. 
because they have the freedom to teach algebra or abstract algebra or linear algebra in the way they like. And they usually don't refer to a book, but you have to sit in the lecture, take notes and um, read the script they provide you with. That's how they encourage attendance. <laughs> yeah, so, so when I was a student, which is still some time ago, but at the same time, I'm not super old. So we still went to class and like took notes from the board and copied everything from the board and then read some textbooks, but they were not really aligning with the class. Um, aware of the time, I want to ask yeah. Lee, Mark did. Mark uh, did. <laughs> Uh, and our uh, uh, wonderful student assistants have left uh, some snacks for all of us for the brown bag. That's great. Um, so if folks want to continue the conversation, uh, I would highly encourage that to happen. Um, but I just want to formally say thank you, uh, Dr. Metzl. Thank, thank you. Thank you.